Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Middle Class Rockstar, episode number 43. And we're now on all streaming platforms, including Spotify and on YouTube, if you want to see our pretty little faces while we talk. My name is Andy Sido. I'm your host. I'm a singer-songwriter, a touring artist, composer, music teacher when I'm home, college sports lover, baseball card collector. I sound like a poor man's Paul Simon or Jackson Brown. Uh, mixed with a roots rock vibe reminiscent of Tom Petty or Nathaniel Rateliff. How's that for an elevator pitch? My guest today is Andy Frasco. I've been looking forward to having him on for a very long time. I first met Andy at Globe Hall in Denver a few years back. I was opening up for him, just a solo set. And when his band came on, one or two songs in, his keyboard broke. There was a malfunction of some sort. And he said, well, can I borrow yours? Can you? Can we put it back on stage? So I did. And he said, well, sit in for a song. And I said, sure. So I sat in. And after the first song, he said, you should just keep playing keys. And I did, I think, for pretty much the rest of the night. And within four or five minutes, I had a beer dumped over my head. I had a joint in my mouth. The saxophone was blowing beer out his horn, and Andy was off in the back corner somewhere smoking a joint with fans. <laughs> My experience might seem unique to you if you've never seen Andy Frasco in the UN, but it's not really. That's how their shows go. Everyone is on stage, or they might as well be, because the band has no limits and no barrier. If you haven't seen them live, check them out next time they're in your town. Andy, in my opinion has navigated the quarantine better than any other artist on my radar, um, any other artists that I've seen. He hosts virtual dance parties, parties, excuse me, he hosts virtual dance parties, he has a weekly shit show, and he posts hilarious videos that often have absolutely nothing to do with music. He really shows people his personality, and he gives everybody a fun, positive, and crass environment. Um, and, and he's made a lot of people happy over the last few months. I know every time he uploads a new video, I can't wait to watch it. Um, and whether it's music-related or not, it's they're hilarious. They're always hilarious. He has one... Um, you know what? I'm not even going to... You just need to go see these videos. He's He did one uh, after the Jordan documentary came out that you should go watch. You should go watch them all. Um, but anyway... Andy's just uh, a great dude and a positive dude. He recently got a house in Denver, um, and so we live, I, I think, not too far from each other now. He has a brand new record out called Keep On Keeping On. We'll hear a track off of that later. And in this interview, we talk about therapy. We do not talk about his new record. Oops. Uh, his relationship with Andrews Osborne and what it was like touring 250 shows a year before he had a whole bunch of fans, when he was just getting started out, when he jumped in the van with whoever he could take with him or hire uh, when he got to a town, and what that was like. I have to mention my dear friend Rachel Miller, who is his day-to-day -day manager um, at 7S Management, and I know her very, very well. We go way back. It all started on Apple Court when we were two years old, and I would say we became a pretty successful street. Rachel, who lived right across the street from me, ended up becoming a manager at 7S Management 20-some-odd years later. Her next-door neighbor, Nick Rothschild, ended up becoming the weekend sports anchor on uh, Channel 7 News in Denver, and I ended up sitting on the floor of my bedroom in my underwear writing songs. So, Rachel, I want to take a second and thank you for making this first introduction several years ago, and... Yeah, and for being my friend. Also, th thanks for being my friend all these years later. Okay? Thanks. Before we jump in, I want to say a quick thanks to our sponsors. First off, Narrator Music. Narrator Music offers simple and affordable licensing for sync. To go check out their catalog, go to www.narratorrf.com. And PQ Mastering. Patrick at PQ Mastering puts the finishing touches on this podcast, and for any of your audio or restoration needs, go to www.pqmastering.com. All right, let's jump into the show, my conversation with Andy Frasco.
Here we go. Andy Frasco, what's happening? What's up, dude? Fucking enjoy my Friday. Friday's my day off. It's nice. I normally don't have days off on Fridays when you're on the road. It's like uh, I'm having opposite schedules ever since, uh, you know, the quarantine happened. It's kind of nice. So what, how is your Friday different? I'm guessing the joint in the morning is it happens all the time, right? Um, the joint in the morning... I normally don't like smoking during the day. It gives me anxiety, but I I woke up with anxiety, so I don't know why. I I drank, I don't think, I guess I drank a little bit. Sometimes a stronger weed just like fucks my morning, but we're going to see how it goes this (laughs) this morning, buddy. So good, good. It'll have the opposite effect this morning. Yeah, I feel like when you already have anxiety, maybe I'll turn it off or something. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I'm down with that. But let it. But we'll know, we'll know as the show progresses whether it's working oh, yeah. or I, not. I talk about my mother and shit. Just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Well, um, just a quick introduction on <laughs> on who you are. How'd you How'd you get into music? What made you What made you want to do this? Um, I love the music industry, man. I, I was. I mean, I grew up listening to like pop punk music and like something corporate newfound glory of course and i worked for drive through records and i thought i was just gonna be like a record exec and be a band promoter and or a booking agent just on the other side and uh and it was 2006 and i didn't and i didn't realize that uh the you know shazam and whatever not shazam what is it like napster and what was the other one limewire limewire that's right fuck shit up (laughs) for everyone so they fired everybody and i'm like i'm just gonna take the the skills i learned in high school and and um start playing music and just market myself you know just kind of do the blue you know blue collar uh you know blue collar musician style and just get on the road and I booked myself for like seven years straight doing 250 shows a year, um, just like in my van and basically Craigslisting musicians to back me up like Chuck Berry. And um, from there on, I, you know, started building a fan base and now I've been doing it now for about 14 years. So it's coming together. That's rad. And it's interesting to me that you, come from the opposite angle i feel like most people in the music industry wanted to be a rock star and it didn't work out so they got in the industry you wanted to be in the industry and then you kind of you did the opposite thing yeah i I, i'm jewish i like money and stuff so it's like (laughs) i didn't i was like oh i love music but i did you know at first it was like i just how am i going to make money doing this you know it's like because i you know you hear all these horror stories of all these musicians not reading their contracts or not, you know, just getting fucked. Yeah. I didn't want that. So I wanted to learn everything I can about the music industry before. Cause I, I, the whole end goal was to be a musician. When I was a kid, I was just, you know, doing battle of the bands, like lip singing in front of a mirror, just like working on my moves and shit, you know? (laughs) Right. I've always wanted to be a lead singer for like a band, like real big fish or like new glory was like super energy. The crowds, you know, going left and right swaying. And, you know, I didn't really get to, wasn't able to uh, do that for musically. And I I just morphed into uh, what is my sound now is just, you know, energetic, uh, you know, soul music, I guess. Now, does the audience that started coming to your shows influence the type of music that you're making now? A hundred percent. I mean, um, the jam scene got involved with me, what, seven years ago. I got on all the festivals and kind of ran with it. And um, so we we're. I was just focused on like live performance because that scene is all about live performance. You know, records don't really mean that much as the, the, the last concert they went to, you know, right. like that means more to them. So I, to, um, yeah. So that like kind of, kind of steered me. Cause I never would listen to jam music. I was listening to like folk and like death cab for cutie and like postal service and like Damien Rice. And I never even knew that fish existed really. And, so I kind of like started going this way, listening to Almond Brothers, Van Morrison, the band, and then like Muddy Waters, BB King, like, and it kind of just I kind of veered left, and uh, 
you know, I, I'm thankful I did that. Cause I've, you know, being in a pop punk band is fucking hard. Yeah. You know? Cause you only get like your, a lot of those tours, there's five bands on a tour. You have like 30 minutes to prove your point. You know, my scene now is like, I, I can play for two or three hours and I'm like, fuck yeah, give me some more. So it's like, it's a nice scene to be in. It's nice. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a lot of pressure cause you have to have a new set every time you come into town. Right. And right. if you're gigging four times a year, that's like you're playing that town three or four times. They expect something new every set. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about how the touring started because you are somebody who's a total road dog. Um, and I, I watched a little bit of those two documentaries that were posted. God, one of them was 10 years ago. Um, oh, dude, where I'm picking up shit and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's excellent. It's hilarious. And it's funny to see, it's funny to see you with the guys then and some of them you're still playing with. Um, yeah. Which yeah. is really cool. But you're going out and touring 250 dates a year. I presume at first to nobody, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, um, you know, I, I can't, or like people, maybe it was a packed room. Like my game plan in the beginning was I'm going to hit every bar in these state schools and colleges and college towns that were doing like $2, like you call it, you know, like, you know, just to have a packed room, then it's my job to figure out how to entertain a bunch of fucking bros just trying to get laid. You know, it's like, so I was working on just like my entertaining skills, but like, yeah, like, but like there's, there was duds for sure. I mean, for maybe the first five years, if I was doing 250 shows a year, the first five years, at least 175 of them a year were nobody there. Yeah. And like, so basically you're living off of, you know, the game plan was to, all right, let the venue feed us. If we make a 200 bucks, we'll have gas money to get to the next town. We'll find someone's couch to sleep on because, you know, it's like when you just let go for to the universe, you know, you will, the universe is going to take care of you. You just have to like, kind of just like go with the flow and not either be pissed off that it's not going your way or be pissed off that um, no one's at the show because in the beginning you're doing it for the experience of traveling. I mean, you know, you want to be a traveling musician cause you love seeing the world. So yeah, I, we didn't care if there was no one there. We just wanted to get fucked up and go hang out <laughs> and stay at people's houses and get to know what Arkansas is and what, you know, the inner skirts of Germany are and, you know, just be people who want to see the world and want to understand, uh, you know, that we're all the same. It doesn't matter what part of the world you live in. So, and I know, I know it's tough to, uh, I shouldn't say it's tough. It, an audience that's a full house. Like if you were going to go play the Gothics theater tonight and it was fucking packed, that would make a difference to you on stage. You'd be performing for that as opposed to if you were going to go play at the Gothic and nobody was there tonight. Right. It, it for sure would make some sort of a difference, but you seem like you're going to go ahead and have, have fun no matter what. Yeah. 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 I'm a, I get more nervous when there's two people in there. Like yeah. there's, we played for like 20,000 people and I wasn't as nervous as I was playing. I did stand up comedy by myself with, and for five people. And I was more afraid <laughs> yeah. to do that. You know, right. like I think it's because of the eye contact, you could see everyone's eyes, you know, and as a front man that I'm always looking this way, I'm not looking at the band per se, unless we're like jamming and getting in a flow, but like we build our band builds a thing where, we have a tight background so I could basically throw curveballs and audibles so I could read the crowd. I'm like, Oh yeah. So I've been playing some of the jam stuff. It's not working in Germany. All right, we're going to go back to songs and going back to the lyrical, the chorus, the hooky choruses, or if we're playing for Cougars, we're going to play some love songs, you know, it's just yeah. like kind of, that's like, I think of being a front man as being a quarterback, you know, sometimes defenses are, you know, are here to trick you. And, uh, you just got to play with it and just be open to not to just being open to following your gut on how to react when like, say you land a joke and it killed last night, but tonight, you know, like you don't want to play blame it on the pussy for like 
woke people in Portland, you know? <laughs> like, so you, you think know, about that. In Denmark or like, you know, it's, so it's like, it's just, you know, it's, it's strategizing and audibling throughout the set. And through that, it makes me present. And being present is the main reason why we play music, right? Because that's when we feel free. Being there. And, and talk about a little bit going through these shows, um, these first few years and i'm asking these questions because a lot of the people that listen are musicians so those first few years on tour where you're not necessarily having a ton of people show up what were some of the struggles of that um whether it was getting rebooked at a venue where there wasn't a lot of people or keeping bandmates how were you able to navigate that well i mean a lot for the the venues you play bars so in the beginning you're not playing like Unless you're trying to like really, I think the game plan for the first couple of years is just play rooms that have crowds. And then you could, you know, don't rely on, put the pressure on you to sell hard tickets. Like go to venues where this is our first time here. We're going to the best venue, the best 300 cap venue. Yeah. And we're going to do it right. And no one shows up. And then it it deflates, you know, it deflates the energy of the group because you wake up in the morning and if no one shows up, at least you're at a bar and no one shows up, you got the fucking bartenders to back your ass up. You know, That's like, right. oh, let's right. fucking go, let's hang out, let's party till 4 a.m. and get to know each other. And then slowly by slowly, the bartenders, like, Frasco came in town, no one, but this guy, you gotta watch this guy. And then slowly, that, you know, the word comes out. Um, for the band thing, you just gotta be completely transparent, like saying, like, this is how I've met my band. I was like, Ernie, was at a guitar store and I heard you play guitar and I'm like, just sitting with me at night. I was playing at the venue where he was looking at a guitar. I'm like, sitting, I heard you play saxophone. And he sat in and I just told him, listen, I'm leaving tomorrow. You want to come with me? Yeah. And we're going for four months. And basically when you're not going to make money, I think I paid him about 200 bucks a month or something. So you guys were just splitting whatever you made. Yeah. Or just like, Splitting everything we made, but we put everything in the pot so we could live on the road for 10 months. I mean, if we had, if we get, if we didn't have any expenses besides the road, then that's cheaper than doing like a two month tour, waiting another four months. And then you have bills that get stacked up because you need to find a house, you need to find rent. And, you know, it's hard to find work when you're always out and about. So, like, I, the game plan was like, just stay on the road. 10 months a year. Let's just stay on the road and we'll figure it out. We'll build this family and we, you know, end up staying at someone's house or for two weeks or just like, and build these families and just like, just live on there. So when you go, I think people get depressed is when they go home and they have no money in their pockets and they got a girlfriend or whatever. And they're like, fuck. Yeah. And they just sit on the couch and feel like a piece of shit, you know? Right. So, I think you just stay on the road until you start making money. And then, then the strategy is playing less. And like, once you build a fan base, then you should only see them once a year. But while you're building a fan base, you should see them three or four times a year. Right. Right. See them all the time. Yeah. Go say what up. Like just so, you know, it's like, it's like a new, it's like a new relationship. When you first, date you want to fuck all the time you're fucking you're fucking (laughs) talking and fucking and like yeah this is great you're like fucking in the fish tank you know like all this shit and then you know a year later two years later you get to know them and they already know you don't have to fuck so much i guess and uh (laughs) you get to know each other and then you don't have to like do that entertain me entertain me all the time my attention span then you can just come in there once a year and do your thing you know was it hard to convert some of those the frat the 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 college the frat boy groups that were coming in to the bars like when you're playing the bar with two dollar you call it was it tough to convert those people coming in that are already drunk into fans uh, to come see you next time? Yeah, no, yes, yeah, yes and no. Okay, it's if you want they'll remember your name, they won't remember your songs. So. Okay. If five years, like, oh, this guy's a great party. This guy's a great, he's wild. He gets fucked up. He gets drunk. And I used to, I just like 
do lines on stage and just like just like just be crazy like yeah, yeah. and i wasn't even really a drug head i was just doing it to get people to watch me right you know like I, but then i got that i got that tag where it's like he's just a party guy and i was like i wasn't doing this for the party i was doing this for the lyrics you know i was listening to damien rice i was listening to you know something corporate and who were all about uh, all lyric based and um so I kind of like had to reshape my game plan because cool, they're going to come, they're going to come. But the minute you move to that, the venue where you need them to not play at their favorite bar on Friday night, that's how you know if they're fans or not, right? If they're going to come out to the next place. If they're going to come out to the hard ticket, because no one, I mean, when you're trying to build the fan base and like try to get agents and managers involved, right. They're not gonna give a fuck if you sold out uh, Big Willie's in Manhattan, Kansas, if you can't sell 200 tickets in Chicago or, or 500 tickets in these major markets. So like, if, if one thing I do regret is, actually I don't regret it at all because I, I built my chops on it, but I just played all these small towns for 13 years. Yeah. And, when I got a manager and an agent, I had I basically had to start over and just play the big cities. But you'd been you played so many live shows, I mean thousands, right? So Yeah. It, you know, you went went that route with it and attracted a manager and agent. So I think it, it worked for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's basically having a management and an agent is basically having another band member. You know, yeah. it's not no different than the bass player. They're just their abilities is, you know, spreadsheets and visionary and how, like how to do a successful tour and how to help you. I mean, I, I, I consider my, I mean, my management saved my life, you know, Rachel and Brian, they, yeah, I would have been playing the bar scene and still fucking randoms and, <laughs> and yeah. doing blow and just, you know, so they they made me take it seriously. And that's, I mean, that's important yeah. is that it is a business and it is a livelihood and we have to take it seriously, but we don't have to take it too seriously. We could still live our life, you know, yeah, it's the type of career that um, you could be exactly who you want to be. You don't have to wear a mask, you know? So when I see people who just are trying to get famous and not writing music to write music, yeah. Absolutely. Kind of annoys me. <laughs> and and now what uh, and at what point was there something that happened when you started seeing people come in to all the clubs, right? When it when it was all of a sudden you're like you announce a show in Manhattan, Kansas and you know you have fans coming to see you. When that started what was the point when that started happening? Was it going there 15 times or was there also a thing that happened? Did you have anything like, oh, I got invited on Jam Cruise and then people really started showing up at my shows. Was there any one event that you felt like really gave you a nice bump along the way? Um, yeah, a couple. Yeah, so like, I think Jam Cruise helped me with my tickets for sure. Rock Boat, those cruises, I mean, it's the press. Like, you get on your first festival and you get your first write-up. And then the jam crews come. Yeah, it's the, the tastemakers for sure. But it's also, I, I think people start showing up to the clubs when you start writing songs. You're not just playing covers and doing, you know, your originals, but it's all a 10-minute groovy lick, you know? Yeah. You start getting famous, or not famous, but like you start getting, start selling tickets when you start writing songs and people want to listen to it on Spotify and they want to, Right. They want to listen to it. You know, they want to listen to it. They want to take you home with them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you were just mentioning a second ago, people are, are doing something to try to get famous. And I think, I think we all fucking hate that, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of people do it, right? A lot of people are doing things for the I mean, subconsciously. Maybe I'm doing it too sometimes. Right. right. Sure. You know, it's like we're all because society, this, I mean, this is like the new awakening where people are not putting up with bullshit anymore but when we're fucking like this all the time and just judging everybody 
through a like and not actually calling them and telling them how they feel. You know, you're just talking to your friends through a like on an Instagram post now and not like calling them up and saying how we feel. It's, it made us lose track of intimacy. And then, so what else can we do? Oh, my friends are going to like this. So I need to get a, I need to get famous or a bunch of people like this. Yeah. Because there's no intimacy anymore. So it's, we're, we're relating intimacy through, through um, relating intimacy through just social media. And that's silly. You know, I've talked to more people now on this quarantine than I have for the last 13 years on the touring. You know, like I talked to musicians and like, not just a, hey, how you doing at the festival? It's like, now we're like, so tell me about your mom and shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like we're getting to know each other again. And, and through social media at the same time, right? It's like through that outlet too, that, that we're getting a lot of times getting to reconnect with people or connect more with people, right? Totally. And you know, it's like, what do you do with it then? Is it just like a, a distant hello every six months or like, let's reconnect. Let's, uh, let's, let's move this social media relationship to a personal relationship where we text each other and call each other and ask how, how we're doing. Andy, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, I can't believe the response I'm getting through this, uh, through this uh, fucking, through my podcast, through this talk show I'm doing, this live stream talk show, this dance party. People are just, people are sad right now and they need someone to keep them happy. And I thought, this is my time to take a break. But when I took a break, I didn't, didn't, I felt sad about it because this is the time when they need their entertainers the most, you know, yeah. this is the time where, you know, when people are lonely, where you, you need to put on your, put on your big boy pants and, you know, help these people out and through optimism. So, you know, I'm a little tired, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy when my fans see what I'm doing and genuinely, you know, and reason why I'm doing it, you know, I'm not just doing it just to put my face out there. I'm doing it because, you know, I want us all to be together on this. And when I, when I've been feeling that love that the reciprocation of them just hitting me up and stuff. So I'm fucking pumped up. Well, I have, I have absolutely mad respect for you. And, and I think of all the artists that I follow, um, you have navigated quarantine the very best. And I'm not saying that to three other people. I'm only saying that to you because when I get online and I see these funny videos and nor, and like, I don't watch videos all the way through cause I have a short fucking attention span, like all the rest of us millennials. Um, yeah, no. but like when you post up a video, I had just gotten done watching, uh, you know, the, the last dance, right. And you oh, yeah. up that thing. And I was like, yeah, I was wondering, you know, like that guy, like what the fuck was up with him? And th and you made a whole video out of it. And, <laughs> and but like I would sit there and just crack the fuck up and sometimes watch it two or three times and then be in like a really good mood or or seeing you interview people or seeing you sit down with like, you know, Anders, who's like my biggest yeah. music. I wouldn't be a musician if it weren't for Anders, you know, what, Osborne. Yeah. Oh, sick. Yes. Yeah. Nice. And seeing you sit down with him and just seeing like, and the dance parties too, where you're like, dude, he's not even playing music right now. He's just fucking dancing. Yeah. Um, and that's, and that's really cool. And I think, I think a lot of people maybe struggle with being themselves or, or kind of what you're talking about, bridging the gap between, um, am I doing this to get attention or am I doing this because this is genuinely me? Who am I genuinely? Um, and when people watch you, it just is very natural. You're just Andy fucking Frasco and you're doing your thing. And, uh, it's just, it's a cool thing to watch. Well, I appreciate it, man. I mean, it's just trying to be honest and trying to be authentic with yourself. And if we could be, if we could be authentic with ourselves when we're by ourselves, why are we scared to be authentic with ourselves when we have people around us? Right. I, mean, I think, that's the most genuine we can be is when we're just honest and you know, you're not a lot of, you know, people are probably going to hate what I fucking do and that's fine. Or, and then, but at the end of the day, when I'm, you know, dying or whatever, I, I'm going to be proud that I was 
my complete self throughout the years and throughout the ups and downs of this career. So, you know, this is my way to just hopefully get people aware that it's okay to be authentic with yeah. themselves and however they want to do it. If you don't have to, fuck, if you don't want to play guitar right now, don't play guitar. Go fucking sew some shit, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Do whatever you feel that's going to get you to that happiness when you're fucking on the swing when you're in third grade or fucking eating fucking cookie dough ice cream like after school and you're like fuck yeah dude you know like oh, yeah. like get out from fucking school and like mom takes it bash and rob or something like get the cookie dough like, fuck you yeah. that's yeah. the best that's the best kind of ice cream i've had way too much that in quarantine oh yeah you've been you've been getting the the quarantine 15 or what no no i because i run 20 to 30 miles a week but i've been eating a lot of cookie dough ice cream fucking people in denver are freaks Freak athlete. That's my that's my escape. Listen to the iPod or listen to the. I, I don't have iPods anymore. Listen to Spotify yeah. and and run. But, I feel like a piece of shit now because I moved to Denver about six months ago, and I get asked to go hiking every day, and I'm like, oh no, no, I'm working, I'm working. But like these people, this is their life. This yeah. fucking being fit and shit. I'm like, I gotta start. I gotta start getting into the Colorado way. I'm gonna get a fucking. I'm gonna get like no neck and fucking. Tribal, <laughs> tribal, yeah, tribal, tribal muscles, you know? <laughs> How are you liking Denver so far? I love Denver. I think Denver is, uh, oh, someone's at my house. Hold on one second. I, I love, hold on one second. Let's yeah, in, invite him in. Well, this is fun. <laughs> we might have a special guest. Who knows? All right. I'll say a quick thanks to our sponsors. Patrick at PQ Mastering uh, puts finishing touches on this podcast. And for any of your audio restoration needs, go to www.pqmastering.com. You like this? I'm not going to cut this shit out of the show. I'm just going for it. So this is all going to be in the show. And uh, thanks to PQ Mastering, our sponsor. Uh, Pat. Anything. My neighbor, my first time meeting my neighbor, dude. She's like this old sweet lady. She's in my uh, my garage is open. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's gonna give me enough time for my second sponsor, uh, Narrator RF, which offers simple and affordable music on licensing for sync. Go to www.narratorrf.com. Boom. I got the ads in there while you were gone. Wow. What a fucking multitasker, dude. We're good. I'm a pro. What's the you know? I love. What's the most What's the, the, the next thing you're expecting from Amazon that you're excited about? Uh, I ordered um, a His School Messenger record. Why? I, you could have got it for free. Your home is with Rachel. <laughs> I know, I know, but, but the band camp was doing a, doing a promo where they were donating proceeds, so, so I, I did that. Well, good for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you got the new new. Yes. Yeah. New, new. Any of the best? She Mike is the best. best. Oh, yeah. Oh, great tunes. Great tunes. He understands songwriting and he understands humanity. Like, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. What, what do you, uh, what'd you get from Amazon? Today, I got a Judd Apatow book called Sick in the Head. Wow. I actually haven't heard about that. Oh, this is great. He interviews all, like, the people that he basically started his career with. And I'm really into, like... Like I love producers. Like I, those are my guys. Producers like Judd Apatow, and um, John Stewart, and Dave Chappelle's of the yeah. world. Those guys really mean a lot to me. So I like studying those guys and like coaches like Phil Jackson. Yes, I love, he's so smart, dude. And how he like and how to like manage alter egos. Like going back to your question, like how do you keep a band around? Yeah. Phil Jackson was the perfect guy for that. He, he had fucking Michael Jordan, who was just fucking talking shit and everything. He had Dennis Rodman, who would just fuck hookers and shit all the time. He went on vacation mid-season. Yeah. You know? And then you have, like, uh, Scottie Pippen, who's, like, low-key feels like he's the best player in the world, and he got a shitty contract. So sometimes he'll just be a baby. Yeah. You know? And 
those three guys. And then you have to surround yourself with like dudes who compliment, you know, compliment the stars. It's just, it's, it's about, it's uh, keeping a banner. It's about just like finding personalities that work off stage. Yeah. You know, cause you're only on stage for two hours. So you're living with these guys and you gotta, you gotta want to hang out with these guys 24 hours a day. So you got to be that person all the time. You can't just be a stage act. No, I mean, your band sees right through that. Of course. And they'll, you know, then they'll start, uh, you know, it's fake. You know, I think the, the, the best music is the realest music, you know, and the realest personalities. Those, the best bands have all these personalities just form well together, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when you were talking about, uh, oh wait, no, I had a, I had a spinoff question. I know you're a Lakers fan, but but which Phil Jackson, which Phil Jackson do you like better, the Bulls Phil Jackson or the Lakers Phil Jackson? I like um, Nick's Phil Jackson. Okay, okay. Nick's Phil Jackson was tight. Oh man, I'm obsessed with. It. I like Phil Jackson when he coached in um, like Puerto Rico. Yeah, because he. Moved out there and had to like build chemistry with a team who barely spoke English. Yeah. And they won a championship. Yeah. <laughs> so fuck. It's like music. It's so universal, you know, companionship and brotherhood and, and joining in as a community is so universal. We don't have to think about it. We just have to connect the dots, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you've been and, and talking about being ourselves all the time and being who we are, not giving a shit what anybody thinks. I do. I see two. Like I feel like there's two sides to you, sort of. Where um, if I, I feel like just from talking to you a couple times, if I was going through some shit, um, whatever it is, I feel like if you if you were my you know my my neighbor my close my guy down the street i could probably call you up or go have a beer with you and you'd be a good guy to talk to you'd make me feel better you'd be a good buddy um you'd like the sensitive side right mm -hmm. who listens to these songwriters of damian rice and stuff like that sensitive andy and then there's also i there's also what class clown andy or funny you know the guy who's up on stage doing you know crazy shit uh do you have any internal struggle between those two parts of you or, or are those incorrect parts of you, but do you have any internal struggle between those two parts and meshing them together? Um, I used to, when I was worried about what people thought about me. Yeah. But now, you know, basically the alter ego, the ego is on stage. Right. So I, I, formulated an idea in my brain that says all that stuff is in me like it's like i call it the anxiety like just fuck it you know just, just yeah, you know. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i need to get it out and i felt the only healthy way to get it out is through us through entertaining and the stage because if i kept it in i was gonna be suppressing yeah and when you suppress you start when your when your soul starts talking to you again, you stop listening to it. I think that's when people start forgetting who they are because they suppress those things they used to love when they were a kid or loved out because it probably pisses off their wife or it pisses off their husband or it it you know I have a professional job and I shouldn't be like that. Yeah. Well, you just keep suppressing and keep, and then it just hardens and hardens and then we start becoming ghosts of ourselves. So, yeah. you know, there's, I'm an Aquarius too, where it's like, I need a balance. I can't just like tilt it. Like when I go too much sensitivity, I, and then I, I go binge, I go fucking snort some ecstasy for like three days, you know, yeah. just like, it's just that I learning how to balance the wave of life, like kind of, and that's what I've been, you know, practicing as I get older and, but I still need that craziness that's in me. I've always been like that. I love, I love that side of me as well. You know, I used to fucking regret it, but you know, I think there's many layers of people. They don't have to be just one layer. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. Have you been doing anything? Well, I should say, what is it outside of music that you do to keep you sane or or challenge yourself? I mean, what what else are you into? Um, it's a good question. I this industry takes so much for me. I spend twenty. Um, I sleep for five hours a day. So, or I've been sleeping more. I gave. I've been like seven now. So. Seven hours a day, I wake up and I just think about this music thing nonstop until I go to bed. Yeah. And I work on it. I work and I work and make, you know, I do, if it's not confirming shows, I'm building a show for the talk show. If it's not building the show for the talk show, I'm building the show for the podcast or making a sketch video. And when I was on tour, I was doing the financing for the band. If it's not, it just, this industry takes, if you want to succeed in this thing, it has, it, you have to give it 130, 40%. Right. So like I really, I learned I don't have any hobbies anymore. And that's what kind of made me sad. Like I don't have anything else besides music. And so this quarantine was like a fucking brush of fresh air, fresh air, like finally moved into a house. I love fucking laundry. I love, uh, I love watching old basketball games. Um, I, yeah, I love basketball. Just like I love coaching mind state. Like I love the art of producing a show. Like yeah. it's just fun. It's like, and I'm OCD and I need to be doing something. I'm ADD. So it's just, I feel like I'm I like editing now, like editing, like on a premiere and iMovie. It's I was going to ask, fun. are you editing all those yourself? Yeah, I, I did most of them. The nice quality ones, like um, um, The Last Dance and like a couple other ones, like my 420 recap. That was all my buddy Danny. Like Danny and Dola, they, those guys have been my best friends since middle school. And I, I just started doing these shit shows and they're like, I'm coming in and from LA. So they one by one came in and they got stuck with me for two months. And we just yeah. fucking fucking made a talk show built all this content i learned so much because danny is an editor for like naked and afraid and he goes on he's you know he's just wow so it's just i think art doesn't have to if you like if you're an artist you don't just have to do one art yeah yeah i consider like spreadsheets and art too yeah i love spreadsheets i love spreadsheets and whiteboards. I got whiteboards all over my room. Dude, me too, bro. I got whiteboards everywhere. We're a crazy breed. Um, I know. So how, do, how does life change now that – well, I, I'm not going to say quarantine's over. I'm not saying any, any shit about us being – Oh, out jinx here. it! Yeah, but how does, how does things change going forward for you now that you have really cultivated the online thing, the videos, the shit show um, – you've had your podcast for a while, the world saving podcast, but you, you've kind of done all this online stuff and made the best of it. When you can go back to playing your normal shows, maybe that's next year, maybe not. What, uh, what changes for you long-term because of what's happened in the last few months? Um, I don't think nothing. I think, uh, I, I, I built a, concept for this show where I could tour it and I could do it on the road and I don't have to play so many shows, but I could live on the road still yeah, and do it and like make it a traveling road show, you know, so I could do all of it at once and I don't have to, I could, I don't have to play as much anymore. I could do, I don't have to, I could just be on the road to be on the road like Anthony Bourdain and I, <laughs> yeah. That's like been my dream since I was fucking eight years old. It's just, I remember my first happy dream was just remembering looking out the window and just seeing trees just pass me and, and towns pass me and fucking rivers pass me. And I was just smiling, just loving being on the road, uh, being in that car, you know? Yeah, so, you still, there's not a part of you that's like, well, I'm getting a little older, you know, I'm in my thirties. I'm going to stay home more. You still want to be out there doing it. Fuck that. What are we going to do? We're yeah, going to just yeah. stay in our houses till we die. Right. Or are we going to go explore everything we can? Cause you never know when it's your turn to leave. 
yeah. you know, you might as well go do the things you want to see. And I still have a lot of things I want to see. And, you know, don't get me wrong, living in a house and just chilling is fucking tight. Yeah. I couldn't do it every day. Right. I need to get out. I need to get the itch. That's one of the things that's hard is with all these shows, I'm stuck in the house. So that kind of makes me sometimes I get depressed or anxious because I don't know anything other than when, she, you know, being in a town for, you know, 11 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. Because you drive for the first six and then you're there, you're at the venue, you get to the venue, do your routine. I go walk to the closest coffee shop or like, like newsstand place and then take a walk back, do the sound check, do your mean greets, play the show, get fucked up till about 3 a.m., go back to the hotel, wake up at 8 and drive seven hours. Do it again. Do it every day for 250 shows a year. Do you get fit, fucked up after the show always nowadays or do you have a couple – do you have a, you know, a couple beers or, or something? Do you do something to prepare you for the stage? No, I never drink. I don't drink during the day. I, cause I'm working. I don't want to, if once I start drinking, that means I'm, I'm starting partying. So like, if I don't drink, my mind's focused, you know, and I have to be focused cause I have so many things going on that if I go bucket smoke a bowl, like I can't smoke weed during the day. Yeah. When I'm working, I just fucking space cadet and I start overthinking and start thinking about, you know, just, you know, overthinking and start getting depressed. Like, uh, that's one thing about getting older is I smoke less weed. So, but. For better or worse. Yeah. What? For better or worse. There's less weed. Yeah, for better. Yeah. But now we're sponsored by all these fucking weed companies for the podcast <laughs> that, like, they just keep on throwing me these ounces and I'm just like, the weed is strong out here, bro. I don't know if it's the altitude. I remember when weed was just like some fucking sticks and like got high off of Now it's just like you're having an existential crisis every time you're smoking, <laughs> smoking weed out here. You know, I've, I haven't had very much, but I'm not a big pot smoker. I'm, I like my alcohol, you know. Yeah. That's my poison, but I'm not a big, I'm not a big smoker. How many days do you drink a week? Uh, uh, most of them. Most of them, do. probably, probably all of them. I've yeah. Been, so do you go, do you, did it take you to get drunk to go to sleep? No, no, no. I like to not, I like to not be drunk when I go to sleep. I like, but really? Yeah. Yeah. You, I like to have it wear off. I probably start oh. a little bit earlier than you do. <laughs> I'm, I love getting fucked up and like getting fucked up, going to bed fucked up. It's awesome. I, t I always, uh, I always wake up a bunch in the night, which I know is weird for most people, but like I wake up a bunch in the night. If I'm, if I go to bed and I've had a bunch to drink, I just don't get a good night's sleep. I end up getting up four or five, six times with a headache. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know why that is. I think I'm different from most people, but I don't like crash out and get a good night's sleep. If I'm really drunk, man, lucky you, <laughs> Maybe. I can't sleep out here because fuck, it's so dry. I'm like, <gasps> I barely drink enough water in here. Maybe because I'm drunk, but yeah, yeah, you have a point there. You're probably right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So you've got, you've got this, uh, this podcast you've had for a while, World Saving Podcast, and it's getting a lot of, uh, it's getting a lot of weekly streams now. What, what was the inspiration to start the podcast? And are you still, uh, are you still enjoying it? I love the podcast. Yeah, it's great. I get to, I think I get to know p new artists because it's an hour long. It's an hour and a half long. And I get to meet artists and we could talk about it. And they trust me that I, I'm not going to like, if we talk about, you know, drugs or pussy or whatever, or, or some dick, I don't know, whatever y'all are into. Yeah. And we then we start getting into if we're addicted to that kind of stuff. And then if we start doing that, <laughs> then we start getting into if, we need therapy. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's the end point is just trying to get to know each other and seeing what we need in life. Yeah. You know, outside of what we give to others. So it, it, it taught me how to, you know, talk to people and 
be intimate with people because I never really was because I was always had this idea in my head that I'm just leaving tomorrow so I shouldn't get to know somebody. But now you're getting to know people. Now I'm getting, yeah. Now I ask questions. I'm calling people and now we're talking and it's been great. I started a, a, a network, a world, sa- it's called the World Saving Network with Billy Strings and stuff and we're, we're signing podcasts. It's pretty cool. So we're building shows and we're building the Vince Herman show in Denver. And like, we're just going to build a bunch of fun personalities that, you know, everyone, all the bands don't have jobs this summer. So you're getting everybody. So it's like a, it's like a collective of podcasts, like a label. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Yeah. I'm excited. World saving network. And so Billy strings has one. I have one. Um, and then we're going to produce, he's going to like sign some bands. I'm going to sign, sign some talent and we'll just make a fun little entertainment network while we're not touring. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. I'll subscribe to that. Fuck yeah. So do you get therapy? Yeah. 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 I haven't gone in a while. I feel good. I felt good. And he's like this old Jew, you know, like he feels like he's like my grandpa and he's like, Yep, you're depressed. You've been depressed for 15 years. <laughs> or like, yeah, he's like, I'm like, yeah, but you're a drug addict. Oh yeah, you're addicted to, you're addicted to sex. And mom, yeah, fuck. And, oh yeah, it's all, you know your mother. Yeah, this is about you know something about your mom. And like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then you know, but like, yeah, that's the reason why you go to therapy is so you stop suppressing. Does he help you uncover shit that you didn't know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I didn't know that I was depressed. I didn't know I was anxious. I didn't know I had panic attacks. I didn't know that I thought I was just born like this and not, and then I was not taught like this, you know, like I was taught everything. I'm not, you can be untaught something. I thought I was just, this is just going to be me forever. Yeah. And to understand the idea that you're just taught this and you could be untaught, it's just going to take time. Really helped my mind think oh, I'm not fucking crazy for living on the road for 15 years. You know, <laughs> I'm not fucking, I'm not, you know, crazy that I, I like to get drunk every night. You know, you just got to learn how to, um, you know, unteach yourself how to the traits that you don't want in your life anymore. But he doesn't. And now when you're talking about like drinking and stuff or like, Oh, I'm not, it's not bad that I want to do this every night. Does he ever, does he try to talk you out of doing anything? Or does oh yeah. He He's like, why? Oh, he just says, why are you drinking? Are you suppressing? Or are you drinking? Cause you're having fun with your friends. And that made me realize that, yeah, I don't need to over drink. I was over drinking because I felt like I had to be the fucking party guy. Yeah. I had to go, you know? Yeah. He said, you don't have to do that. Just do exactly what you want to do. Cause I, I have control normally, you know, I know when I, I need to say no. And this is, this is why I stopped. I've stopped doing blow. Now it's been, I don't know, two years now I'm off the Coke. I'm just doing mushrooms and drinking and smoking a little bit. I did eat ecstasy last week, which was fun as fuck. Was was there any, was it bad at all or was the whole thing good? Well, the reason why I don't do drugs is the hangovers. Cause I don't, I think I'm dying. I always, even with everything, I'm a hypochondriac. So like if I got like a hurt elbow, I'm like, oh fuck, I got cancer. It's over. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm just yeah. neurotic like that. I'm like Jewish neurotic. So like when I, like I love the party and then, I wake up and it's like the hangover is just like, fuck this, you know? Yeah. And then you start going depressed and you start getting anxious and then you start overthinking why you're sad. And all of a sudden you go into this fucking spiral and all of a sudden you have these dark thoughts. So what's the point? Right. Right. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting to chat with you about that. I've, uh, well, you talk to a lot of people that, that have been in therapy and you also, I think there's probably a lot more people that do it that you don't know. 
they don't know are in therapy. They don't know are addressing these thoughts or, or whatever. Yeah, but I think people are scared. They think they have this like bad idea that therapy is for crazy people. And it's not. Yeah. It's just a friend that you don't have to like deal with their emotions. You can just vent. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's not personal because this is their job to get things out of you. Yeah. And there's less weight on the words that you feel like you're going to judge or they're going to judge like whoever you tell it to is going to judge you. Right. And that's not, that's not fair. And that's one thing we can't judge people anymore for who they are. You know, right. this is why we're protesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Things are changing. Yeah. Things are changing. We hope. Oh, um, okay. Have you taught? So what are, what are your thoughts about what's been going on um, the last few weeks? Um, and not to get into super heavy subject, but to get into super heavy subject, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on what's been going on? Have you been in, in what's been your involvement in the movement? You know, I, like I said before, I'm a hypochondriac. So I was scared I was going to get COVID in the streets. So I said, how can I, how can I help? So I use my platform. I use my social media. I feel like I was stronger making my point in social media than walking with the protesters because they're doing that's fucking awesome. I'm fucking proud of them. I was so nervous about COVID. I was like, oh shit. You know, I'm already, sm I smoke a pack a day. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a human cesspool. So yeah, God forbid I had, if I have COVID or if I ever had it, I didn't know because I lived through so many fucking germs living on the road that maybe I don't have any symptoms of COVID. Yeah. But I give it to someone. Like, I don't want that. Like, I was worried about too because I'm crowd surfing and shit. I thought I gave everyone COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, walked through the tour and just like, you get some COVID. You get some COVID. Right, Cause you, right. Because you, know, you think it's the Wook flu or you think it's the fucking, <laughs> you know? He's like, oh, yeah, I got some food. food. I did, you know, stayed up till six with, with Amber Lynn. <laughs> you know, just yeah. Like. Yeah. But uh, going back to your stories, um, yeah, I built the video. Uh, I, we wrote this song off our new record, Better Days, and we compiled um, clips of, you know, everything that's going on through the protest and just, and I'm sharing a bunch of stuff, but, you know, with uh, just, Getting my goal is to just show that everyone is coming together. Yeah. You know, does you know, we got to come together. Yeah. And that's the only way this is going to work. If we meet in the middle. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been really, it's just been really cool to see everybody, everybody doing something, you know? Yeah. And cool. I, I think for me, I, the first time I actually, I've been sharing some, things that I think are useful resources from other people. But the first time I actually shared something was on this week's podcast episode that came out yesterday where I did a segment on the podcast for it. And, and I've, I felt I like I finally could. Um, and I know everybody has been the past couple of weeks. Maybe I was late to the game, but I, I had a, put together a post that I was going to put up on Facebook or something. Um, and I realized that the only reason I was doing it right then was for approval from friends or not to be ostracized by friends, uh -huh. even though I'm all about, I, of course I believe hundred percent in the movement, but I wanted to take time to educate myself on it first and really understand, try to understand more and ask more questions before just putting something up, you know? Totally. I, I mean, I agree. And this is our time, especially as white people to listen. Yeah. And yeah. not even just listen. Yeah. Yeah. And pass, be a vessel and pass the information. If I have a platform, if you have a platform, listen and pass the knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to chat with you really quick about uh, one of your podcast episodes and, and actually you just had him on your, on your shit show too. Um, Anders Osborne. I he's recovery. To, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's recovery and, and a therapy guy too. Um, uh, he's 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 my Buddha, man. We we he texts me every morning what he's grateful for, and I text him back what I'm grateful for. I was I was gonna uh, get into that actually. I think that's really neat. I 
I probably wouldn't. Yeah, like it, he was a big part of me being a musician. I remember the first time I saw him was in Telluride, in uh-huh. one of those, um, who the fuck is this guy kind of things where I was I wasn't even by the stage and there was just something calling me towards the stage and it was just this amazing uh, uh, presence and getting to speak with him a few times, open for him and stuff. Um, he's just he's a really best. he's a great great dude. Um, and when he was on he was on the air with you a couple weeks ago. You guys were talking about those texts you guys do every morning. Um, how much does that do for you? And how did that start happening? Um, I interviewed him on the podcast and we just started. No, no, we did a podcast on mental health with a uh, uh, Nietzsche space in Athens. And I was like, this motherfucker is cool. I'm like, I don't know how he's going to like me. I fucking smoke and drink. And he doesn't like, doesn't, you know, when you're torn with him, I think you just don't, you can't be around it. And I fucking totally see that. Yeah. And um, such a sweet guy. And then we got, and then I did, I got him on my podcast and we did a FaceTime. It was the first um, interview I did through FaceTime and not person to person. You know, so that's hard. And uh, we just, it was so natural and it was so cool. And I'm like, I want to, hey, why don't you text me? I'll text you that. And yeah. just jokingly on the show. And th- since then, every single day. Every he's single day. He, in the morning, he's, I wake up, I don't wake up early. I guess he's New Orleans and he had kids. So I think he wakes up just at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. So I'll get a text at 8 or 7.30. Like, Love you, Andy. This is what I'm grateful for today. Oh, wow. This motherfucker is the man and he's the truth. Yeah. And he, you know, and that's how honest I want to be. And that's how dedicated I want to be to my fans. Like how Andrews is to me. You know? Yeah. And how Dave Schools is and Vince Herman. You yeah. know, we're all, we all need someone to look up to. Yeah. He certainly is somebody to look up to. Um, sure. Have you guys missed a day? Um, he, he hits me up every day. I, I miss every, I, I miss one. I, I miss every other day. So I'm, I'm on there, t- t- but he's still resisting. He keeps on sending. I'm like, fuck yeah. So you're a dick. You're not even getting back to him half the time. No, I'm just <laughs> no, like, like when I say every other day, yeah. seven days, I'll do five. Yeah, sure. Sure. It's just some days like you, you, you wake up in the morning. I don't know if it's just you, but I, I still sleep on the couch because I'm so used to tour life. Yeah. I'm most comfortable on the couch. So I'll just go to the couch. I'll get his text. I'll have a cup of coffee, smoke a cigarette, and then go straight to work. And then it's 8 p.m., 9 p.m. because I'm a psychopath. I don't leave my desk for 14 hours. Like, I'll just go. Just work. And then I just forget. But that's the reason why we're doing the grateful thing is to be present. So I've taught myself that's the first thing you do in the morning and it's been better. That's, that's really cool that you guys can help each other be present like that. And it's cool to have somebody to do that with too. You can kind of hold each other accountable and, and um, you know, thinking about what you're great. If everybody thought about what they were grateful for every single morning, um, that would be, the world would be a better place. Yeah. You know, you know, I forget that a lot. (laughs) Damn bro. So, it's uh no it's a cool thing well i i appreciate you very much for for coming on the show and uh you know i hope to get to jam again soon yeah come over to the house dude i got a couple keyboards yeah that'd be awesome let's do it let's do it yeah, damn, let's write a song or something i'm in i'm in andy squared we'll start a band that's we, that's a great fucking band name and we're both piano players we can be a dueling pianos group. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I'm in. Make a video where um, we imitate each other. <laughs> I'm gonna need to grow the hair out. No, I'll just I'll just do this and you'll get a wig. Oh yeah, grow the hair out. Yeah, Perfect. Grow. I'm in, baby. I'm in, bud. <laughs> Later, bro. <laughs> Thanks, bro. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good day. You too. Later, bro.
All right, folks, that's all. <laughs> that was a fun conversation. I really, uh, I really enjoyed chatting with Andy. And who knows, maybe, maybe the dueling, the Andy squared thing will happen one day. That would actually be that would be really cool. I would love to do it. Do I would even just a gig, do a dueling pianos gig with Andy at some point, like just at a random bar or brewery around town, something like that. Just show up and and play for a couple hours. It'd be a lot of fun. I'm gonna play out this episode with my favorite track off Andy's new record, Keep On Keeping On. It's a song called Getaway. I hope you enjoy. For any questions, comments, concerns, hate mail, death threats, guest suggestions, you can reach out to me directly at middleclassrockstar at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Rewind the time. Maybe-